Council of Faith. Please stand with me as we say our worship declaration. O oh Lord, send your anointing. Move by your spirit. Heal and deliver. Have your way in my life individually and in our lives collectively. Glorify yourself and show yourself strong as we worship and praise you and open our hearts to hear from you. In Jesus' name, amen. And I will call Sister Wendy to read the scripture this morning, followed by Brother Leonard to pray. There's just um, two scriptures hitting me here, Matthew 6, 33, but seek first his kingdom and his righteousness, and all these things will be given to you as well. Therefore, what? Do not worry. And these are times of worry for some, but therefore don't worry. And... Matthew 7, 8 says, um, well, we'll start with 7. Ask and it will be given to you. Seek and you will find. Knock and the door will be opened to you. For everyone who asks receives. What? Everyone who asks receives. He who seeks finds. And to him who knocks the door will be opened. Yea, God. Amen. Yea. Hallelujah, Jesus. <coughs> Praise your awesome Well, good morning, even the ones I think we're still believing that those seats are going to be filled this morning. Amen. Yes. Amen. Amen. The Lord, we just, just uh, so good. So anyway, you know, it's so good to be able to get together again, to worship with one another, to fellowship with one another. It says in the Word, don't forsake the assembly of some have. So Lord, we just thank you and give you praise, glory and honor. We get together, to share your Word, to be in the house of prayer, to be in your house with, with other believers, just people of the same kind of faith, oh God. Oh, Lord, how we thank you. But through all these things, Lord, God, that there were many, many, many souls, one for your kingdom, oh, Lord. And, Lord, I just thank you for this day. I thank you for the ones that attend here, the ones that are still watching online, Lord God. Lord, we just ask you to bless your people. Pour a blessing, a double portion upon them, Lord God. Have their cups running over. Anoint them, oh, God. And, Lord, we thank you as you move by your spirit through this place today, Lord God. Anoint the worship leaders. Anoint the pastors. He gives the word, Lord God. Let those lips that claim be anointed with the Holy Spirit. And Lord, I thank you again for this day that we gather together with one another and worship you and glorify you because your name is worthy of worship. You are the one to be worshipped. We just praise you worship in the real God. Oh Lord, how precious you are. How glorious you are. How merciful and forgiving you Oh, how we thank you that we be called sons of God of the Most High. Amen. Amen.
like this. Hopefully we will be able to uh, congregate together again in larger numbers as we come together in the assembly of the saints and bless our God. Amen? Amen.
behind us strong. Thank you for your grace. Thank you for your strength this morning. We bless you, mighty God. Thank you so much. You may be seated for a brief moment. alive even in famine. You will satisfy our thirsty soul even in a time of drought. And God, from you all blessings flow. And we just give back a portion to you this morning, God, and just to say thank you for all your many blessings. In Jesus' name, amen. 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 Thank you. 
Praise God. And we don't have much announcements today because this is our beginning of the new era. And we won't be having any Bible studies, Sunday school, or that for now to be announced when that will resume. And all the other activities that we usually do, the pastor will direct us based on Alberta Health Services recommendations, what it is that we can and cannot do. Found it quite challenging not to sing. I caught myself a few times. But it is such a pleasure to be in the house of the Lord, singing and worship. I watched on my sofa, but I'm telling you, there's nothing that beats the congregating of the saints. Amen. I will now turn over to our pastor, Pastor Raymond Moore. Amen. Amen. Praise the Lord, saints. Come on, come on. Praise the Lord, saints. Hallelujah. That's, that's more like it. Thank you. It's good to see you all today in the house of the Lord. I know um, slowly but surely the saints are going to start coming out. I know it's still a time where there are many that are in the high risk categories. And maybe they would just rather not come on out for now, and that's okay. We're still live streaming, so um, those that are home can still be a part of, of the service. But it's just uh, so good to be here and so good to see you. Feels a little bit different today. Amen. Amen. Uh, hallelujah. Um, God is so good, and He is worthy of all our praises. You know, um, I've been quoting the scripture quite a bit since the quarantine where David said, I was glad when they say unto me, let us go into the house of the Lord. And uh, oftentimes, maybe we don't even think about it, but we take coming to church for granted. And uh, here comes a time where restrictions are placed on us that we weren't able to gather as we would like. And sometimes it may be personal things like uh, sickness that has overtaken your body or something like that. And you would love to be in the house of the Lord and you aren't able. But it's good when the saints can come together and congregate. And I, I still sense uh, some tension, some hesitancy, some... You know, uh, we, we can still be free in the house of the Lord. I know they're recommending that we refrain from congregational singing as much as possible. But uh, let's still be free in the Lord. We can still clap and dance. And uh, uh, shouting amen isn't singing or shouting hallelujah isn't quite singing. So if I'm preaching and you feel like shouting an amen, go ahead and shout an amen. Go ahead and, and say hallelujah. I just want to say uh, a happy Father's Day to all the fathers in the house and to those that are watching. Uh, blessed Father's Day to you. Uh, pray that you will live to see many more and that we will rise to the challenge and be a good father in every area. Not just to be there physically and not be there emotionally and all the other ways that we are there for our children in every way and some aren't biological fathers but they have taken it upon themselves to be a spiritual father to, to many and um, thank you for that so hope you enjoy your father's day my youngest daughter Aaliyah she came to me this morning with a nice little bracelet it was supposed to be a, a chain but um, it wasn't quite long enough to fit around my neck so we just improvised and made it into a little grace that she said dad I made you a chain for Father's Day with your two favorite colors and I'm like oh that's just so nice so um, amen so that's why I'm brandishing my bracelet here today God is good and to our great and awesome father we bless your name at all times because you are good Amen. Are we ready to get into the Word? Yep. 
Are we ready to get into the word? Yes! Hallelujah, hallelujah. I'm going to ask you to turn with me in your Bibles to the book of 2 Kings, 2 Kings chapter 4, 2 Kings chapter 4. I'm going to be reading from verse 8 of 2 Kings chapter 4. Just uh, follow with me as I read. Now it happened one day that Elisha went to Shunem, where there was a noble woman, and she persuaded him to eat some food. So it was as often as he passed by, he would turn in there to eat some food. And she said to her husband, Look now, I know that this is a holy man of God who passes by us regularly. Please let us make a small upper room on the wall and let us put a bed for him there and a table and a chair and a lampstand. So it will be whenever he comes to us, he can turn in there. Verse 11. And it happened one day that he came there and he turned into the upper room and lay down there. Then he said to Gehazi, his servant, call this Shunammite woman. When he had called her, she stood before him and he said to him, Say now to her, look, you have been concerned for us with all this care. What can I do for you? Do you want me to speak on your behalf to the king or to the commander of the army? She answered, I dwell among my own people. So he said, what then is to be done for her? And Gehazi answered, actually, she has no son, and her husband is old. So he said, call her. When he had called her, she stood in the doorway. Then he said, about this time next year, you shall embrace a son. And... He said, and she said, pardon me, No, my Lord, man of God, do not lie to your maiden servant. But the woman conceived and bore a son when the appointed time had come of which Elisha had told her. And the child grew. Now it happened one day that he went out to his father, to the reapers, and he said to his father, My head, my head, he was having a headache. So he said to a servant, Carry him to his mother. When he had taken him and brought him to his mother, he sat on her knees till noon and then died. Wow. And she went up and laid him on the bed of the man of God, shut the door upon him, and went out. And she called to her husband and said, listen to what she said to her husband, please send me one of the young men and one of the donkeys that I may run to the man of God and come back. So he said, why are you going to him today? It is neither the new moon nor the Sabbath. And she said, it is well. I believe if you have a King James Version, version it says, it shall be well. But she said, it is well. Then she saddled the donkey and sat and said to her servant, Drive and go forward, 
do not slacken the pace for me unless I tell you. And so she departed and went to the man of God at Mount Carmel. So it was when the man of God saw her afar off that he said to his servant Gehazi, Look, the Shunammite woman, please run now to meet her and say to her, Is it well with you? Go to her and say to her, is it well with you? Is it well with your husband? Is it well with the child? And, and, and I would encourage you to underline those three words. Is it well? Or as she declared to her husband when he asked her, why are you going? And she says, it is well. We're seeing a few, it is well, or it shall be well, or is it well in the scripture. And she answered, it is well. Now when she came to the man of God at the hill, she caught him by the feet. But Gehazi, Gehazi came near to push her away. But the man of God said, let her alone. For her soul is in deep distress and the Lord has hidden it from me and has not told me. Wow. So she said, did I ask? Hallelujah. Did I ask a son of my Lord? Did I not say, do not deceive me? Then he said to Gehazi, get yourself ready and take my staff in your hand and be on your way. If you meet anyone, do not greet him. And if anyone greets you, do not answer him. But lay my staff on the face of the child. And the mother of the child said, As the Lord lives, and as your soul lives, I will not leave you. So he arose and followed her. Father, in the name of Jesus, I thank you for today. I thank you that the saints of God can gather together again and sing praises to your name in oneness, in unity. And Father, I just give myself to you now as you have placed this word in my heart. Let it go forth with power, with clarity, and with authority, mighty God. Lord, I submit myself to you even now. Let me say nothing more and nothing less than what you would have me to speak. I give you all the praise, the glory, and the honor. And the saints of God say, Amen. Amen. I'm going to assume that you have kind of, you've kind of somehow figured out what the title of my sermon is going to be. The title of my sermon today is, It is well. Amen. Many of us, if not all of us, know it is well with my soul. With my soul, it is well. It is well. It is well with my soul. But there is more to it than to just be well with our soul. In fact, the Bible says, Beloved, I pray above all that you would prosper and be in good health even as your soul prospers. So the Bible is already concluding that your soul should already be prospering. However, there are many other things and areas in our lives that might be suffering, that might be delinquished, that might be malnourished. And so it says, I pray above all that you would prosper 
and be in good health even as your soul prospers. And so for many of us today, for all of us, hopefully we can declare that it is well with my soul. But may I challenge you today by the word of God that how many of us can say that in the other areas of our lives. Now, you see, the man Elisha had previously came to a widow that cried out to Elisha because the creditors were about to come and take her two sons away and she had no means to pay. So Elijah said to her, what do you have in your house? I like that question. What do you have in your house? Wow, I, I, I am of the mindset that whatever it was that she would say that she had in her house, somehow Elisha would have been able to put his anointing on it and it would have been a blessing to her. Amen. What do you have in your house? What did she say? I just have a jar of oil. If she said, I just have a jar of flour, Elisha would have worked with it. Whatever it was that she would have said, Elisha would have been able to work with it. And so she says, I have a jar of oil. And she says, go to your, he said, go to your neighbors and borrow as many jars as you can. Go, 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 go. She went out, her sons went out and they gathered all the jars that they could borrow. And Elisha says, go in. And shut the door behind you and start pouring. Start pouring. And the oil kept flowing. The oil kept flowing all the way until there was no more jars. He said to her, go, sell, pay your creditors and live off the rest. So Elisha was well known. And so somehow he was passing by a certain region and this woman, maybe she had a little shop on the street side, but somehow they came in contact and she would, he would always stop by their house. And so she said to her husband, this is a holy man of God. He passes by this way frequently. I think we need to build an addition to our house so that we can accommodate him so he has somewhere to rest while he travels. And so the husband agreed. And after time went by and stopping at this house a few times, Elisha thought of a way that he could repay her for their hospitality, for their gratitude. So he said to his servant, what can we do for this woman? Like, I don't know. Can we speak on your behalf? To the, 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 the leader, to the commander of the army, to the king. She says, no, I'm good. I'm in my, amongst my own people. I don't need no favor from the king. And then in Gehazi I said, actually, she has no son. And her husband is old. Which means life is going to get tough for her. It seems like maybe the husband might be much older than she is. So there is a possibility that life is going to get tough. Because if the husband passes on, she has no children, she is now a widow, how is she going to survive? Let me tell you something, God has a special place in his heart for widows. And orphans as well. He has a special place for you too. There's all special compartments in his heart, you know. But he has a special place in his heart for widows. And so he said, she has no sons. Now, Elisha took it upon himself. He did not ask her, would you like a son? Bear with me here. He declared a son upon her. He says, this time next year... You will have a son. And she said, oh my, my. She says, my Lord, please do not deceive me. She says, no, my Lord, man of God, do not lie to your maidservant. I wonder why she would say that. 
Is it possible that they were like Abraham and Sarah, trying for so long to have a son, and it just wasn't happening? Or was it because she had concluded that her husband was too old? Or was she settled in the position that she was in? You know what? I have come this far without a son. I have learned how to get by without a son. I have become very independent. And me, my husband and I, we've been making things meet and we're getting by. So you know what? Don't change the equation right now. So she said, don't deceive me. But by the word of God, the next year, at the appointed time, could be in the same year, mind you, nine months. At the appointed time, she embraced a son. Could you imagine the joy on her face? The joy on her husband's face. But then the Bible said the child became sick. My head, my head. The father says, take him home to his mom. Maybe just a few hours, the mom, the child was on the mom's knees. And at noon, the Bible said, the child died. Stay with me here. The Bible said, the child died. Now, what I find very interesting about this story, after the child died, she didn't tell her husband. She didn't tell nobody. I'm getting somewhere. But in fact, she said to her husband, Bob said, then she called to her husband and said, please send me one of the young men and one of the donkeys that I may run to the man of God and come back. Like nothing has happened. Well, she, she put a smile on her face. Somehow, she is able to conceal from her husband the fact that their son had just died. Do you think you'd be able to do that? Because the husband did not notice anything, he would have said to her, Why art thou, why art thou thy countenance cast down? Almost like Nehemiah when he was praying before the king and he was the cupbearer. And as he would serve the king, the king noticed that ah, something is up. You're not usually like that. Your appearance. And the king asked him, what's going on? The husband wasn't able to discern anything. So she said, I just need to go downtown and come back. Wow. So he said, why are you going to him today? It is neither the new moon nor the Sabbath. Like, leave the man alone. You have no reason to go to him. Pity he didn't know that his son was dead. But she had concealed it from him. And what she said to her husband, the Bible said in verse, actually in verse 23b, and she said, it is well. Remember, she asked him, why are you going to him today? It is neither the new moon nor the Sabbath. She says, it is well. It is well. She didn't really answer the question. She just said, it is well. Something inside of her caused her to say that it is well. You know, Elisha and Elijah. Elisha was the servant of Elijah. And the Bible says he was on the backdrop for quite some time and you didn't even know he was there. But he was his servant. Somehow, Elisha, I believe, maybe got hint or word that God was going to take Elijah away. 
And so as they would journey, the Bible said, the sons of the prophets would come to Elisha and say to him, do you not know that the Lord is going to take away your master from you? And let me paraphrase it. Elisha pretty much says, shut up. Thanks, but no thanks. You need to understand why Elisha was so desperate to stay connected to Elijah. For one, he had prayed a prayer. He had made a request of Elijah. And Elijah said to him, what can I do for you? Actually, Elijah was the one that asked the question, what can I do for you? Elisha says, I want a double portion of your spirit. I want or I need a double portion of your spirit. It almost seems that even Elijah wanted to get rid of Elisha. But you know what Elisha said? As the Lord God lives, I'm not going to leave you. In fact, Elijah kind of encouraged him because Elijah said, if you see me, now we're talking, we're, we're getting somewhere as in commitment and persistency. Commitment and persistency. Elisha, Elijah said, Elijah said, if you see me when I am taken, it shall be yours. What would you do? So now the only contingency, the only requirement for you to get this, the qualification is that you need to see me when I am taken away. That means I will never leave you. Plain and simple. And I, I believe at least on three different occasions, the, the prophets, the sons of the prophets met Elisha and said to him, do you not know that the Lord is going to take your master away from you? And Elisha had to shut them out. God is going to minister something to us today. Elisha had to shut them out. He was determined and committed and he was willing to be persistent all the way. I need a double portion of your spirit and if seeing you when you are taken is the only way for me to get it, I will not leave you. There will always be people to discourage you, to sway you away from your conviction. There will always be people to sway you away from your conviction. My, my God, I'm so thankful. This woman is like a virtuous woman. She is smart and she got all her marbles together because she knew that had she tell her husband, our son is dead dead, it would be a different story. And if after telling her husband that their son is dead, maybe her husband would discourage her from going to see the man of God. In fact, he was already discouraging her. It is not the new moon and it is not the Sabbath. Maybe meaning that those are the times, the occasions when you would more likely go to see the prophet, the man of God. You don't just go and see the man of God any and any time. For example, the Bible says in the Old Testament, the day of atonement, it had to be a specific time of the year. You dare not enter into the Holy of Holies until it was that time of the year. So the man of God, the, the husband, was making it seem as if you're, you should not be going to the man of God right now because it is neither the new moon nor the Sabbath. But she knew that had she tell her husband the reason why she was going to see the man of God, that he would dissuade her, he would discourage her. And she said, right now I don't need anyone to speak negativity into my spirit. I am persuaded that it is well and so I am going to the man of God because I know that I know that it is well. I did not ask him for a son. 
I did not pray and beg for a son. He put this on me. So he is able. My God, if the man of God was able to speak forth a miracle and bring forth a son, this son that is now dead, I believe that he is able to work forth a miracle and bring him back to life. So it is where I am going to see the man of God. Sometimes we talk too much. The Bible says the devil is like a roaring lion seeking whom he may devour. He's like a spy. And you know how he defeats us many times by the things we say. We reveal everything to the devil. And we give him an advantage. We give him an upper hand. This woman, nobody knew that her son was dead. Not even her husband. When he asked her, why? What's going on? Why are you leaving? It is well. My God. Thankfully, the husband didn't go in the upper room and open the door and found their son dead. She says, it is well. Now, I found something very interesting. It is well or it shall be well. That word well in the Hebrew, I almost screamed hallelujah when I read it. This word well in the Hebrew, you know what it means? For I know the thoughts that I think towards you, says the Lord. Thoughts of peace. That Hebrew word, thoughts of shalom and not evil. This word, well, when she said to her husband, it shall be well, is the same word, peace, in Jeremiah 29. God says, I know the thoughts that I have towards you. Thoughts of peace. So she says, it will be shalom. It is shalom. How can your son be dead and lying in the upper room and you're going to say it is shalom? You see, I'm convinced that God wants his people to speak not based on what they see and what they do not see. Amen. If you don't get anything else from my sermon today, Take this, God wants his people to be able to speak for truth, speak for his word, and speak for from conviction and faith, not based on what you see or what you do not see. Yeah. My goodness, the grief that must have been on her heart, and she could have said a lot of things, but when her husband said, what's going on, she says, it is shalom. I've defined that word so many times. It means peace. It means prosperity. It means tranquility. It means peace as in the absence from war. It means peace as in inner peace. It means health. It means everything that is good is wrapped up in that one word. My God. God didn't want to spend uh, another book telling you all the things that he's thinking Concerning you, that's why he says, I know the thoughts that I think towards you. Thoughts of peace. Everything that is good, God put in that one Hebrew word, shalom. And so the woman says, it is well. It is well. It is well. She did not preach all that was wrong when her husband said to her, why are you going? She could have broken down and said, <laughs> Oh, our son, our son, our son. We have become preachers and many of us preach negatives more than we preach positives. It was a perfect opportunity for her to declare to her husband everything that is wrong. Everything that had just gone bad. Perfect opportunity. Why are you going to see the man of God. She did not go there. 
She didn't go there. She said, it is well. My God, can we get to that place in God when all hell is breaking loose around us? We can still say it is well. My goodness, when Jesus was in the boat and there was a storm, he was sleeping. They woke up, Jesus, Jesus, do you not care that we're dying? Oh, you of little faith. We should have such comfort, such assurance, knowing that Jesus is in the boat with us. She didn't go there. You see, in John 5, it talks about this man that was sick for 38 years. My God, the angel would come down and the angel would trouble the water. As we sing the song, the water is troubled, my friend. Step right in. God's almighty power is moving this hour. And so the angel wants to hear a certain time of year. And the Bible says it didn't matter what a sickness or disease you have. But if you were the first to step into the water, you would be made whole. And so Jesus came by and Jesus understood that this fellow has been sick a mighty long time. And Jesus said to him... Do you want to be made well? Hallelujah. Let's say, do you want to be made well? A question that simply requires a yes and no. It doesn't require an essay or a paragraph, but instead the man start listing all the things that are against him. He uh, replied to Jesus by saying, sir, hallelujah, sir, uh, when the angel touched the waters, no one is there to help me into the water. And therefore, as a result, I am left out. I'm paraphrasing. But you see, there will always be a time and an opportunity for you to preach all the bad stuff. Jesus said, do you want to be made well? My God, you know, I, I plan to do a 15-minute sermon today. I know my wife and my daughter, they're just going to be laughing. Because the Holy Spirit is speaking to me right now. <laughs> Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Do you want to be made well? When you are asked that question, it is not time for you to list to God all the medications that you are taking, all the diagnosis that they have described to you. It is not time to list to God all the odds that are set against you. It's a question that requires a simple yes or no. God does not want to hear your lack of faith. He does not want to hear about all the negativity. Man, 38 years. And now you're asked a question if you want to be made well. And you're going to go into this long... Just say yes! <laughs> Even if he had said, yes, Lord. But every time I make an effort to get into the water, somebody, be, he didn't even say yes and then add the but. He just said, sir. He did not answer the question. Do you want to be made well? Let me tell you something. There will always be a bunch of lists that you can read out to God. And there's a time and a place for that because the Bible says, take your burdens, cast your cares upon the Lord. Tell him all about your troubles. Be anxious for nothing but in everything through prayer and supplication. Let your requests be made known to God. But there is a time when you just need to say, yes, Jesus, help Jesus. Go to the matter and stop telling God all about the impossibilities. You see, the ten spies, they saw everything that Joshua and Caleb saw. 
They all saw the same thing. The ten spies were listing all the odds that were against them. Perspective. It is well. Joshua and Caleb, rather than listing the odds that were against them, they declared and promoted the God that was for them. And that, my brothers and sisters, makes a big difference. Why? The more you focus on the problem, the mountain somehow becomes bigger than your God. And then fear and doubt creeps in, creeps in because like, oh, I don't see a way out. There is no way. There is no way. There is no way because you keep focusing on that. And as long as you focus on that, you, your eyes will not be set upon the God who is bigger, who is greater, who is wiser, who is stronger, who is more than able to do far more abundantly, exceedingly above all that you can ever ask or imagine of him. So when God says, do you want to be made well? Just say yes. Dance. Shout hallelujah. Shout a couple amens and give somebody a high five. Yes, just say yes. Yes. Stop telling Jesus all that other stuff. He knows. <laughs> he knows. He knows. My, my God. It might be well with your soul, like I said before. But it needs to be well with some other areas. It needs to be well with some other areas. It needs to be. It does Hebrews 10 and verse 35. I'm going to read that scripture. I'm not going to. Hebrews 10 verse 35. Actually, I'm going to read a few more verses before. Maybe verse 32 of Hebrews 10. It says. Hebrews 10 verse 32. But we recall the former days in which after you were illuminated, you endured a great struggle with sufferings, partly while you were made a spectacle, both by reproaches and tribulations, and partly while you became companions of those who were so treated. For you had compassion on me in my chains, and joyfully, how somebody say joyfully? joyfully. Yes, and joyfully accepted the plundering of your goods. Let me just stop there for a moment. That is people who continue to give out of themselves without grumbling, without murmuring, without complaining. They joyfully allow the, the apostle to be to, to, to be furnished and flourished by their possessions. They did it willfully. Hallelujah. You joyfully accepted the plundering of your goods knowing that you have a better and an enduring possession for yourselves in heaven. Some of us are too, we grip too tight to our earthly possessions. And you can't take them with you. Use them wisely as God directs and store up treasures in heaven. And verse 35, therefore, therefore, do not cast away your confidence. Which has great reward. Somebody say great reward. great reward. Do not cast away your confidence. Hear the word of the Lord. Do not cast away your confidence which has great reward. This woman had such confidence that when her husband asked her what's going on. All she declared was it is well, if you could encounter Abraham as he journeyed with Isaac to offer Isaac as a sacrifice, hallelujah. If you were to encounter him on his journey and were to say to him, brother Abraham, how are things? Do 
you think Abraham would stop to tell you, man, I don't feel too good today because God had just requested of me something that is so hard. He has requested my son, my dear son, blah, 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 blah. I don't believe, I believe in fact that Abraham would say, just like this woman, it is well. In fact, when his son asked him, Father, I see the wood and I see everything else, but where is the sacrifice? Abraham declared, the Lord will provide. In essence, he was saying, it is well. Well, son, it is shalom. Peace, my son. I know you're worried. I know you're anxious right now, but shalom. It shall be okay. God is on our side. Every little thing is going to be all right. If someone were to encounter the woman with the issue of blood after she 12 years spent all her livelihood seeking physicians to make her herself whole and all the Bible said it got from back to worse. But finally she heard of a man named Jesus and she said in herself, you see, the conviction and the persuasion doesn't come from your lips. The conviction and the persuasion has to come from deep down inside. When the her husband asked her, where are you going? She didn't just say it lightly, it is well. I believe it came from deep down. It is well, hallelujah. And so she heard that Jesus was passing by and the Bible said, she said to herself, hallelujah, if only I may touch the hem of his garment, I shall be made whole. If you were to encounter her on her journey and ask her how are things, she would not list to you the last 12 years of trying to get a cure for her disease. She would not list to you all the money that she has lost trying to get help. She would not list to you her current situation that she had an issue with blood. It's none of your business, but I believe she would say to you, it is well because she had already been convinced, fully persuaded in her heart that if she touched the hem of Jesus' garment, she would be made whole. And the Bible said when she touched the hem of his garment, the Bible said Jesus felt power left his body. Many people were touching him, but no power left his body because they were just doing it lightly. She had a reason to touch him. She had a cause to touch Jesus. And so when she touched him out of her need, hallelujah, his power supplied her need. And long story short, you know the story. Jesus said to her, be it unto you according to your Faith. Mm. Be it unto you according to your faith. Faith will release some things for us. Oh my. Oh my. But there will always be the occasion to be fearful. You don't know of a woman. Orpha, I believe that's her name, how you pronounce it. If I were to say that name, you don't even know who she is or where she's from. <clears throat> but she's from the Bible. Orpha and Ruth. Anybody know Ruth? Yes, you know Ruth. You know why you know Ruth? And why you read about Ruth today? Because she had that it is well mentality. One of the favorite movies that I like to watch is Troy. And the movie has two armies pitched against each other. The army of the enemy, this big giant guy. They're gonna try to make a quick end to the day rather than a big slaughter. Send your best man to fight my best man, whoever wins. We surrender, defeat, and call it a day. 
So when the opposing side saw the big guy came out, they called up for their guy, Achilles. Achilles! He wasn't there. Still sleeping, drunk, lazy, whatever. They sent a young boy to go get Achilles. When the young boy went to get Achilles, he says, the commander is calling for you. There is this big guy and someone needs to fight him. And the boy said, I wouldn't want to fight him. And Achilles said to him, that's why no one will remember your name. That's why no one will remember your name. You shy away from the challenge. So we know of Ruth and not the other wife, Naomi. They were her daughter-in-laws. Her husband died. And her son-in-law has died. And so she said, she heard she had left the land because of famine. And she heard that the Lord had visited his people and their supplies. So she said to her two daughter-in-laws, go back to your people. You have been very good to me. Go back to your people. Both Orpha and Ruth said, we will not leave you. Persistence, commitment. We will not leave you. Shortly thereafter, she said it again, my daughters, please go back to your people. Orpha, she surrendered, kissed Naomi, went on her way. But Ruth, somebody say Ruth. Ruth, <laughs> Ruth said, entreat me not to leave you or to turn back from following after you. For wherever you go, I will go. Where you lodge, I will lodge. Hallelujah. Your God shall be my God. Your people shall be my people. Where you die, there I will die. The Lord do so to me and more also, if anything but death parts you and me. That's Elijah and Elisha. Did Elisha got the double portion? He was committed. He stuck, stuck it out. Ruth, how did things turn out for Ruth? Oh, she was blessed. She was blessed. This pagan woman. Got interjected into the lineage of Jesus. You see, when you have this conviction of what God can do, what God is doing, endure it, press in it, because there will always be someone or something that will discourage you from pursuing it. There will always be. She said it to them twice. Please go back. No. Jacob the Bible said. Wrestled with the angel. And he said. I will not let you go. Until you. Hallelujah. Until you bless me. It. Is. Well. It is well. Bible says, let us not grow weary in well-doing, for we will reap if we faint not. And I'm going to read this scripture, my closing scripture. It is my closing scripture. <laughs> Hallelujah. <laughs> Woo! Thank you, Jesus. God, you are so good. You are so awesome. Luke 18. Luke chapter 18. My God is awesome, he can move mountains. Keep me in the valley, hide me from the rain. Thank you, Jesus. Woo, I haven't sweat this much in a long time. Praise your name, Jesus. Luke chapter 18, verse one. Then he spoke a parable to them that men always 
ought to pray and not lose heart. I had this on the line before. And as I was going through my sermon and I went and I saw this, it just jumped out at me. Man always ought to pray and not lose heart. Mm. Saying, there was in a certain city a judge who did not fear God nor regard men. Now there was a widow. See, those widows, man, I tell you. Now there was a widow in that city and she came to him saying, Get justice for me from my adversary. And he would not for a while. But afterward, he said within himself, Though I do not fear God, nor regard men, yet because this widow troubles me, I will avenge her, lest by her coming, lest by her continual coming, she weary me. It's called persistence. Then the Lord said, hear what, now God is bringing out a spiritual truth, a spiritual principle. That's the parable. Now hear the meat. This is the message. Then the Lord said, hear what the unjust judge said. And shall not God avenge his own elect who cry out day and night to him, though he bears long with them. I wasn't too pumped about that, but I have to embrace it. I says, And shall not God avenge his own elect who cry out to him day and night? Somebody say day and night. Day and night. Yes, day and night. Day and night to him. Though he bears long with them. I tell you that he would avenge them speedily. Nevertheless, when the Son of Man comes, will he really find faith on the earth? You can start out well. You can start out with conviction and with persuasion. But as time goes by, and you see the odds start to be stacked up against you. When you just started, the odds against you were here. A couple years later, the odds were here. When you just started out, man, you had conviction. Man, you had persuasion that God is going to do this. That God is going to fulfill his word. That God is going to do what he said he will do. Because the Bible said his word shall not return to him void. But it shall accomplish what he pleases and prosper in the thing for which he sends it. But you have that conviction. But as the odds are stacked against you, will you still hold on to your conviction? Will you still profess your conviction? Hallelujah. Will you still hold to your confidence, the Bible says, which has great reward? Starting out is easy. Finishing is different. Endurance. It is well, she said. It is well. She could have said something else when her husband asked her. And when Gehazi asked her, is it well with the child? Is it well with your husband? No. Is it well with you? Is it well with your husband? Is it well with your child? She just says, it is well. It is well. Abraham, if my math is correct, 25 years. 25 years. The Bible said he did not waver in his faith. He would say, it is well. It is well. Even when it seems like it's not well, say it is well. It is well. Hear the word of the Lord. Do not change your conviction. Do you hear what the Lord is saying? Do not change 
your conviction. Come hell or high water. Come the odds are stacked up against you ten times more than when you just started. Do not change your conviction. Keep on declaring it is well. Keep on declaring it is well. Shalom over my life. It might not be shalom, no, but it is well. And when you get discouraged, if you need, go to Luke chapter 18 and let it encourage your heart another time. Don't change your conviction. It is well. 25 years. God says you're going to have a son. Now he was past the age of having a son. So do you now change your conviction? I'm of the mindset that I'm going to keep declaring everything that God has declared to me, for me, concerning me, until I breathe my last breath. I don't care what odds are stacked up against me. Hallelujah. It's not for me to make it happen. God said it. I'm leaving it up to you. God, it is well. Why? Because you said it. So I'm going to keep declaring it is well. It is well. It is well. My brothers and my sisters. It is so easy. And God is speaking to me as much as he is speaking to you. That when things aren't going great. And somebody asks you how are things. The natural thing to do is start telling them everything that's not going well. We speak death but yet we want to experience life. When the word of God declares that death and life are in the power of the tongue. I know it's hard. I'm not saying it's easy. And that's why I know that it's not lip service. Because this woman that had just lost her son, when her husband said to her, what's up? Where are you going? Why are you going now? She says, it is well. I don't know the context in which she said it, the voice in which she said it. Maybe she was jumping or dancing or whatever, but she said it is well. The devil wants me to focus on all the bad stuff, all the negative stuff, all the failures, but it is well. And you might not get one challenge, it might not be two, it might not be three, but don't change your conviction. Don't change your conviction. Abraham did not waver. Abraham did not waver. The Lord is saying to his people, we need to speak not based on what we see and what we don't see, but we need to speak from conviction. We need to speak from the truth of his word. It is well. Shalom. Be persistent. Be persistent. God's word will not return to him void. Bow your heads with me, please. Almighty oh, God. Mighty God of Israel, Abba Father, how great and how awesome are you. We extol you today. We bless you for your word, God. As we understand that your desire, your thoughts towards us are shalom and not evil. That we prosper and be in good health even as our soul prospers. So Father God that we will not be content and complacent with the fact of just knowing that our souls are prospering and that we are safe, sanctified, filled with the Holy Ghost and on our way to heaven. But God you desire that we may have life 
and have it more abundantly. And Father, one of the ways in which we do so is by speaking forth our conviction, by standing in agreement with your word, God Almighty, and speak forth your truth. Let God be true and every man be a liar. If you say you are giving us the land, you are giving us the land. I don't care if there's giants in the land. You knew there were giants in the land when you say you were giving us the land. So God, that we will speak according to your word, not according to what we see. That fear and doubt will be evicted from our hearts, God. And that we will not change our confession. Father, Help your people today. Many of us are so keen, are so good at speaking and preaching all the bad stuff that's going on. We are so good at highlighting, recognizing all the giants that are in front. And as we do so, we fail to see you because we're so caught up on the problem. We can't see the solution. Father, remind your people today that the healing, the true healing is not in the water that is troubled. True healing is in you. And so, Father God, we might be looking in all the wrong places at times. Teach us, God, how to set our eyes upon you. When it's hard, when it's difficult, even if it's in tears, we will say it is well. God, even if it's in tears, we will say it is well. Because if God is for us, who can be against us? And when the enemy comes in like a flood, the Spirit of the Lord will lift up a standard against him. So even if in tears, God, when we don't understand, God, help us to declare, not from our lips, but with true conviction, knowing that you're going to come through, knowing that you will do what you say you will do, we will say it is well. And when the devil wants us to say otherwise, hallelujah, when the devil wants us to see otherwise, God, help us to say it is well. To see you in the midst of the storm. Christ is in the vessel. We can smile at the storm. And still declare against all odds. It is well. Father, we give you praise. God, you know every need that is present in this place. And those who might be watching. You know what we have need of even before we ask. So mighty God. I thank you that you will supply all our needs according to your riches in glory in Christ Jesus. Father, I pray that you would intervene in the lives of your people. Show yourself mighty. Show yourself strong on their behalf, God Almighty. For all good and perfect gift comes from the Father above. We bless you. We give you thanks. And we give you praise. You are awesome in this place. You are awesome in our lives. And we give you glory. And the people of God say, Amen. God richly bless you. Thank you for coming on out. It was great to see you. Looking forward to seeing you again next week. Shalom. Shalom. Amen.